we're back. Welcome to Abstractable. This is a podcast for the entrepreneurial spirited amongst us who are passionate about learning new things and about the world around them. And in the podcast, we distill the concepts from the world's best thinkers in business, startups, psychology and history, and we have a chat about their ideas. So in today's episode, we talk about the book Guns, Germs and Steel by Jared Diamond. We talk about why the Spanish invaded Maya as opposed to the Mayans invading the Spanish. We talk about the effects of the environment on technological development and the differences in populations of people. We also talk about why you shouldn't eat wild almonds. So what's important about this book? Well, the question answered by it are fundamental to understanding why the way we are and why the world has been shaped the way it is to today. Don't forget, you can find out full video from our episodes on YouTube. Uh, or check out our show notes on our website at abstractable.co. And if you enjoyed the episode, uh, we'd really appreciate it if you pass it on to someone else who might enjoy it also. We hope you enjoy. Taxes. Lockie? Oh, no. No, no, no. Taxes. Don't, don't we're go supposed there. To, we're don't supposed go to, there. We're supposed to help people want to listen to this show. <laughs> no, it's the office. <laughs> So taxes have been in the news recently, right? And that's because it's about drawing the listener in. <laughs> well, we could. Well, let, let, let me let me throw let me throw the next the next uh, word in. Trump taxes. Okay. Ah, oh, got him now. Now we're now got we're interested. Okay. Yeah. So um, we, I think you probably saw the other day on the news about. You know Trump and his taxes and all the, I think it was the New York New Yorker article that most people have probably seen or seen rehashed elsewhere by now. And then there was the the follow on to that where Trump called out uh, Warren Buffett Did about he? not yeah. So you didn't see this? No, I didn't see it. Okay, do you saw the you saw the taxes thing though? I saw the Trump thing. Yeah. Yeah. So there's been a big. Uh, a big f- facade about you know, Trump not paying his taxes, um, you know, which is pretty clear, pretty clearly obvious. So then he call, proceeds to call out Warren Buffett and Warren Buffett has been – one of the big things that he advocates is always pay your taxes. It's kind of, it's kind of like one of those – he gets an early mention this episode, Taleb things where he says – it's like one of his fundamental principles is don't skimp on taxes. It's like one of those precautionary principle things mm-hmm. because it will catch up with you at some point in time. So Trump proceeds to call out Buffett saying that he he didn't pay his taxes in some some year, like five, a couple of years ago. Not sure what year it was. And Buffett goes, well, I did and – Here's all my tax returns, all of them, <laughs> and you can go through the, every single bit. And and then he proceeds to go uh, because apparently apparently Trump hasn't released his uh, his tax returns because of something to do with him being under audit at the moment. He's being audited by the the IRS. And Buffett goes, I'm also under being audited by the IRS and I'm releasing my my tax records because there's no problem with releasing my tax records under this investigation. Yeah. It's, oh man, it's just the truth is not part of the conversation. Uh, it's, a, it's a show, you know. It's just, it is fewer theatre at this point. I think everyone's like, oh, what if he wins? But, like, what if he doesn't? That's what's going to get real interesting. And probably interesting is the wrong word because it's kind of scary, you know? But, uh, yeah. Yeah. Interesting is our cover all for, for any other better word that should be there. We don't have many good words for it. We just use interesting for everything. So um, tell me, what book are we doing today? It's a, it's a tome, a tome of history. Excuse the pun. Hey, uh, Guns, Germs and Steel by Jared Diamond. Yeah. This is a big book, you know. I mean, it's basically a textbook, right? Almost. Yeah. Well, there's, there's probably as, as many stats and facts uh, in this book as you'd have in a textbook for sure. 
And it's a book about human history. Correct. But a very specific element of human history. It's looking at environmental factors and how environmental factors have shaped who we are. Mm. Yeah, it was. And this is a book that what we're going to try and do here is give our usual bio, but then pretty much set out the question that Jared poses in the book answer that question which is really the the whole um you know 500 whatever pages it is goes through answering this question we'll try and summarize it in a in a quick five minutes for you and then we'll hopefully spend the rest of the episode talking about all the different ways that you can relate what you can learn from this book to to the rest of the world and it is fascinating yeah i've heard this book recommended time and time and time again it just took me a while to get to reading it and um it's it's a highly highly recommended book Uh, i would i would suggest it's a read though definitely a read i tried to listen to it and it was it's too hard to listen to in terms of density of information and and hanging on to things yeah and it might be a book you read over many years it's sort of that kind of book for me yeah, I, 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 you could definitely put it in that bracket. Probably be good to do that because you're coming mm. back and kind of you know refreshing yourself and and bring yourself back up to speed with what's going on. So, Jared Diamond, he is a geographer, a historian, an anthropologist, and a ornithologist. It's a porn star name. Let's just put it out there. <laughs> Yeah, with the, without with it without the uh, porn star job title. Uh, yeah, mind you, he has got a book called "Why Sex Is Fun" or "Why Is there Sex you, Fun." There you go. I told uh, you. So you heard um, it here first. And so he's an ornithologist. Is someone who just loves loves birds and watches birds. So uh, he was born do in. Find, uh, do you hmm? find those people a little bit weird? Ah. Oh. <laughs> Just That's a little the bit. question. Yeah, we yeah. talked about it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yes, I think so. But at the same time, like um, uh, Theodore Roosevelt was known as a bird watcher too. Right. Now it's becoming more appealing the older I get. I think so. You, maybe you're feeling attracted to it. Maybe the, by the time I'm fifty, I'll be a, a full-on bird watcher. We'll wait and see. But, this is the thing, mate, is you're never going to be authentic because all these guys started out when they were really young. They loved watching birds when they were really young. I think. I also think it's like a, an older, a thing of past times, you know. Now we've got Facebook and computer games and other things to keep us occupied at a young age. True. So he was born in 1937, which makes him 83 years old. Uh, and he was born in Massachusetts, USA, or Boston, Massachusetts. Uh, both both of his parents were from Jewish backgrounds and they emigrated to the US and he was obviously brought up uh, in, in a similar way. And then he started learning the piano at the age of six. Now, why this is important is because he later on proposed to his wife, uh, whilst playing the Brahms intermezzo in A major for her. So he, I imagine he got quite accomplished because she obviously said yes. Uh, so he couldn't have been butchering the song. Is that a difficult piece? Well, it looks like a difficult piece. <laughs> it sounds like it. Yeah, it sounds like a difficult piece. Yeah. And uh, shortly after, so age six into the piano, age seven, this is when he's starting to um, embrace that bird watching in a bird watcher in him, uh, which is pretty young. Yeah. Although it's probably an age where you do have quite a bit of curiosity for what's going on around you. Mm. I reckon I reckon Leonardo da Vinci was probably a bird watcher too because he was obsessed with flight. Yeah, you'd think so, and and also cutting things apart. So well, that's, that's if he true. caught the bird, it was in trouble. Uh, then we skip through his, you know, his childhood. He continued on with with um, 
these various hobbies. And eventually, uh, coming from this this family that emigrated, he got himself into Harvard, and he studied uh, a Bachelor of Arts uh, in Biochemical Sciences, uh, which he f- he finished up with in 1958, and then 1961. Uh, after he continued on his studies, he finished up with a PhD in uh, studying physiology and biophysics from Cambridge. So became pretty. Uh, he's, a, he's a very intellectual guy. You know, he's and that's that's been pretty clear from a from a young age. Whilst he's on this path, there's he's been continuing on with this bird watching hobby that he's that started and. Uh, 1964 is the first time that he actually travels to New Guinea. So he's very like he's he must be pretty serious about it if he's traveling to New Guinea to to start getting involved mm. in ecological focused watch, you know, observation and stuff. Yeah. And so this is kind of like a parallel life that he's that he's leading. You get the uh, you get the feeling throughout the book he's very well traveled. Yes, certainly. Certainly. And I think this is this is where he starts to make those these touch points with uh, various Papua New Guinea people, uh, which becomes some of the triggers for this book, and maybe became some of the triggers for his his earlier books uh, as well, uh, related to you know anthropology and things. So he. 1968, he becomes a professor uh, of physiology at the UCLA Medical School, which is like his main, the main track, uh, while still continuing on pursuing uh, all of these, you know, visits, particularly to, uh, to New Guinea. 1999, he gets the National Medal of Science in, in that first track. Hmm. And, um, and then for... I think it was about 19, I think it was around the same time he started releasing his first, his first books uh, related to the stuff that he was doing in this kind of second track, if you will, uh, related to the bird watching. And since then, he's written five books in total. And so the first, or f- sorry, five books that are very, very notable because he's written so, so many different things um, across across his time, not just books, but also different um, articles and and obviously his dissertation and, and, and everything else. Uh, so that I've already mentioned one of the books, Why Is Sex Fun? That, uh, that book uh, was published after The Third Chimpanzee, which is one that I've heard about a number of times from a number of people as well. Apparently a very, very good book. And this is about why 98% of our DNA is the same as chimpanzees. Uh, He's also written a book called Collapse, Upheaval, and then obviously Guns, Gems and Steel, which is is this, uh, the book we're talking about today. He, in 1999, won the National Medal of Science. Uh, He was ranked ninth of 100 by a poll um, by Prospect and Foreign Policy magazines. Uh, he influenced Yuval Noah Harari. So for those that don't know, he's the guy that wrote Sapiens. Well, that's probably the biggest rap of all because he says that if he doesn't like a book after the first 10 pages or something, he just throws it out. So if, if, he's, if he's influenced uh, Sapiens, that's a pretty good, a pretty good track record because that is one of the most uh, influential books probably the last 10 years, right? Oh, I'd have to be because it's, because of its penetration into the mainstream, mate. it hasn't sat on the, you know, in the more academic spaces of nonfiction. It's it's made itself to the, you know, to the as you walk in the door at the bookstore, mm. or as you walk in the door at the supermarket, even. <laughs> yeah, it's. A- so that's um that's a really really succinct version um, of Jared Diamond, but because he's he's had so much going on. Uh, in his time and many, many visits to New Guinea and he, he became quite acquainted with uh, many different tribes living there uh, ac- across the course of um, years and decades. Uh, 
which has been given rise to him starting to ask and introspect on these questions, uh, which you know lead to lead to some of these books. Yeah, super interesting. And uh, you know, this book is effectively about history, but he's not a historian, so I think that helped him kind of solve some of these problems. Um, or, or answer some of these interesting questions that he does in his books. So you were going to give a little bit of human history here. Uh, yeah, about I thought the it was, Homo sapien. I thought it was a nice, and this is this is super. You know, this is literally four points, but I think it's just a nice way to frame up because whenever you whenever you, we're talking and you know you're reading history and someone just throws an arbitrary date at you, it, it's very hard to frame it up unless you've got a reference point. So this might just give us a you know, a nice reference point to go go with here. So 1.9 million years ago, uh, Homo erectus. Uh, this is where we moved from being walking around on all fours. What do we call that, Lockie? Quadruped. A quadruped. And I think we're making that up. Um, Said with confidence, though. Moved- that's the that's the key. You just. Yeah, that's the key. That's how we just that's how we distinguish it from fact from fiction. Confidence. <laughs> you gotta sell it. Uh, but we did move from quadruped, apparently, to uh, bipedal. Uh, that was one point nine million years ago. Long, long time ago. And the reason the reason I wanna uh, talk about the kind of this this time horizon is quite often arbitrary dates get thrown at you, particularly in history books. Uh, or in you know random stats and figures and it's really hard to grasp just where things sit in the scheme of things or or just how long ago they were and i think this might just just help kind of give people a little bit of a framework um Hmm. to kind of frame them themselves for the rest of the the rest of the pod so five hundred thousand years ago was the movement into europe uh, so this is this is where we moved out of Africa and into Europe, and then, or humans did, and then between one hundred thousand and fifty thousand years ago is what Diamond refers to as the Great Leap Forward, and this is actually you probably hear most people have probably actually heard this term, um, uh, and this is this is where we make, or it appears that we make significant progress in terms of social cohesion and social structure and and this is also the time where the voice box uh, becomes fully formed and Jared argues in one of his previous books I think the third chimpanzee again that it was the voice box that was the the catalyst for that change and this is where we start to see you know various bits of art and basic music and th- you know, musical instruments and things, uh, evidence for uh, arising. I think there's actually some caves in southern France somewhere that are very famous for the oldest cave paintings still, you know, left in the world um, around this time. Uh, Then somewhere between 50,000 and 25,000 BC, uh, we actually see uh, Indigenous Australians moving into into the Australian continent, uh, which was which was a, a big, massive feat for back then because it meant uh, faring the seas, and it meant that they have to had to have watercraft to enable them to do that. So that's that's incredible. And then uh, twelve thousand BC was the first humans into Alaska, and it took another two thousand years for them or for humans to reach the southern tip of South America. So 2,000 years, taking it to 10,000 BC. Mm. That's like, you know, us starting starting out in zero or one AD and then only just arriving to where we needed to arrive to 2,000 years, you know, later this year. It's, it's a long, long time. It is a long time, yeah. Particularly when you frame up like the tech, you know, the pace of say technology development um, these days. It, we've had the iPhone for ten years. <laughs> we've had a computer for twenty or thirty or forty years. You know, uh, not a long time. Yeah. So awesome framing because this book is about kind of 
how humans moved across the world and, and really about why different groups of people ended up dominating other groups of people effectively. And it's kind of based upon this question that he heard from a tribesman in Papua New Guinea when he was there assumingly doing his bird watching or something like that. And it was a guy called Yali and he asked him, he asked Jared, why is it that you white people developed so much cargo but we black people had little cargo of our own? And this was a question that he couldn't really answer. Um and he was kind of taken aback for it by it and spent a long time researching this book to answer the question. And so I guess to frame it up, if you genuinely believe that people are relatively the same across groups, which the data does play out, there are seems to be a lot of difference within groups, um, but between groups of people, we're all the same. So when you actually stop to consider that, you this becomes a super interesting question and something that needs to really be answered um, to kind of explain the world. And f- the wrong answers to this question have been really the source of a lot of um, racism and and problematic <laughs> parts of, of, of our history. Yeah. I think, you know, like um, unveiling, mate, just, you know, a peak of some of the answer. Cargo cargo implies a lot of things and cargo uh, in the sense of this, the scope of this entire book really uh, has an inflection point at the agricultural revolution and that's where the change between hunter-gatherer and between an agriculturally developed society uh, occurred because people moved from a mobile lifestyle into a sedentary lifestyle. And there's so much framed up in that very question uh, about that. The super interesting part of this question is if, like, just kind of pretend it's not humans that are doing this and it's just like some sort of artificial you know, widget or something in a computer game and you dropped it on one of the computer game maps and you drop, you sprinkled all these different widgets across the same map and you come back a thousand years later and all this stuff's happened, you know, and you really just don't really know why. And so the actual question here, this is like a really interesting look at what it's about systems and about systems in a random environment over a very, very, very long time frame. So it's kind of a complexity question as well. Yeah, correct. Com- complex systems. So the, the, the entire premise that Diamond sets out at, at, you know, at the start of the book is as follows. History followed different courses for different peoples because of differences amongst people's environments, not because of biological differences amongst people themselves. That's his. That's and his claim. Yeah. 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 So that's the that's the major the major premise at the start of the book, and um, and that's what he sets about going to answer and just showing how much of an influence environmental factors have had, and. And even probably preceding environmental factors is luck, you know, just chance, just yeah. so happy, you know, this this absolute chance for for how and why things have happened. So, do you so want to I'm tell us like you, uh, answering some yeah. of the some of those factors? Yeah, I'm going to answer his question. If he was standing in front of me and I've read Jared's book, I'll try and answer Yali's question. Give us the elevator pitch version. So the answer is that effectively the environmental types that you are placed in are responsible for the differences over the long period of time. And it plays out like this. Well, you've got many different main differences. So one of them is the geography of where you live. Is it mountainous? Is it uh, flat? Is it a desert? What's it surrounded by? That's one type of environmental factor. 
Others are weather. So what, what are the weather patterns where you live? Is it cold? Is it hot? Does it rain a lot? Are there a lot of droughts? These sort of things. And that plays into, well, the other two types of things which really humans relied on are what can we eat So, and what can we use to kind of leverage our efforts. So the first one being what kind of plants are around? So am I surrounded by cactuses or am I surrounded by sweet potatoes? And lastly, what kind of animals are around me? And if they're animals that are can be easily domesticated and some that can't, and so whether you have horses or zebras makes a huge difference as to what you can do with those animals. And that has a kick-on effect as follows. If you have a lot of domesticable plants and animals and have a relatively fertile area and geography, you're able to start farming. And at some point, someone will kind of figure out farming. And this has happened, as Jared says, many, many different times across uh, in isolated areas. And if you're allowed to, if you start, if you start farming, you increase your population density because you're producing a lot more food and you can feed a lot more people. And those people don't end up just working in the fields. A, short, small, a portion of that population are able to do jobs that aren't purely to produce sustenance. And so innovation happens. And then once those that innovation happens, sort of three different types of things occur. Um, you invent weapons. Um, you invent kind of building materials or things like that um, or better tools and things like that. And you also start having diseases that ravage through the populations and over time you get an immunity to those diseases. So then if you're that you and you get that kind of, uh, I suppose, luck in the first place and develop these type of societies, you then expand out and you weaponize those things that you've you've had so your inventions and your and a lot of the time your germs yeah <laughs> some yeah and what what's super clear is preceding the you know world war 1 and world war 2 the greatest killer of of humans was germs or were germs <laughs> uh, and germs that had been brought from one part of the world to the to another part of the world. We're seeing a pretty and good, uh, pretty good example of that right now. So. We are, and and even you know, as as catastrophic as it is, the numbers aren't near to matching what, yeah. again, the wars were, yeah. just because of just how extreme those events were. In, in human history. So to tease this out and to tease out some of the detail that he goes into, let's go into just like one or two examples around the sort of plant and animal domestication because this is a pivotal part of the book and something that shocked me was how few actual plants and animals we've actually domesticated. I'd never, I'd never thought of this before. No. No, not at all. You think, you think you go out to the out to your little veggie patch and pick some strawberries, and that's the way strawberries have been. But it's simply not the case. Um, every single plant, every single animal that we eat um, has had to be domesticated, and domestication takes a long, long time because you're 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 essentially uh, facilitating the evolution of those. Uh, those plants or animals to be better suited for our, you know, our needs, which is crazy. You're kind of playing playing God to some degree, you know, in this domestication process. Um, so just I just also want to wind back before we go into that, Lockie, is just talk about uh, and make a real point of nuance and how important nuance is across many years. We even talk about nuance today, you know, make a small change today and it leads to a big change, you know, a year from, a year from today type thing, you know, or do that. 
we're talking about thousands and thousands and thousands of years here and minor factors in what plants you have available or the weather patterns that you have or the geography that you have make huge compounding benefits uh, across time it's you know I, we can't understate that enough and you know even even just one of the, one of the ones that really kind of grabbed me in the book was just talking about uh, orientation of geography so it's not it's not you know how how wide versus how high is is you know is your continent or your you know your area of land and how big of an influence that makes and then moving you know so if if you have a very uh longitudinal i guess uh or elongated towards the um towards the geez i've, I've butchered this so if you yeah, have a very narrow, if you have a landmass that's big. narrow across the top and the bottom <laughs> <laughs> then then uh, you are presented with a lot greater challenges than if you have a wider uh, across the top and the bottom uh, landmass. Mm. And the reason being is you can div- you can utilize the same plants and animals because your climate isn't changing. And that's assuming your climate isn't changing, like assuming you haven't got big deserts or other big obstacles and things in the way where the weather drastically changes across that that distance. Yeah. Uh, you go, Matt. No, I was just I was just gonna say another important factor is this the you're in a very fragile environment to kind of further your point. You might also treat the environment like shit, like all human societies did. But it, and do. it won't <laughs> yeah, and especially and do. Um and but your type of environment won't grow back. But if you live in an area that's a bit kinder with the weather, you can be a lot more. You can be the same level of brutal with your environment, but it'll it'll still be there. Yeah. Case in point, um, the first agricultural farming that cropped up in Africa was in the Saharan de- Desert, um, and there was other places. I think I think in the Middle East as well. Um, where what we now see is just complete desert were thriving agricultural environments mm. and there's huge shifts that that you know human intervention has made across time uh, in some of these places so plants plants and animals we can't just pick out pick the strawberries from the veggie patch unless they've been domesticated so just a couple of you know hard facts here like wild almonds contain more cyanide than needed to kill a human so if you had you know if you were a hunter gatherer walking around back prior to to almond domestication and you picked off an almond and ate it off the or you know picked off the the fruit and ate it off the tree you would die (laughs) quite literally die and so that the almond has taken a wild turn from, you know, being this thing that is going to definitely kill you if you eat it to now, you know, we, we eat a handful of almonds and we don't really think about it. Although we won't get into the anti-nutrients of the skin of almonds, Lockie. Um, we'll save that for another, another, another episode. <laughs> don't even know what you mean. Uh, peas, 8,000 BC, were domesticated. Olives. 4000 BC and just remember that kind of that timing that we spoke about earlier on uh, in the in the episode strawberries f- somewhere between 500 BC and 1400 AD um, pretty loose in terms of in terms of the range there uh, pecans weren't domesticated until 1846 that's crazy yeah and there's and so there's 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 plants and animals that are just very hard to domesticate or impossible or as far as we've been able to achieve, impossible to domesticate. Talking about animals for a second, zebras, they apparently cannot be domesticated. 
that's why we don't see people riding around on zebras like we do see people riding around on horses mm. or camels, which is incredible. That's, you never really I never think thought about, about that. that, no. Yeah. And the, the, what's so important here is is one of the most important factors in in kind of the, the jump up was the was that plant domestication because plant uh, sorry animal domestication and whether your uh, your habitat had these animals in the first place and uh, because the animals don't just provide so like you know cows and sheep and uh, you know these large animals don't just provide uh, a source of food they also provide a source of um, leverage and labor. So we're able to ride horses or we're able to use horses to start plowing fields and things for us. And that doesn't get considered. So when you're able to move with the help of, you know, having plants that you can eat, reliably eat, and having animals that you can leverage uh, to do, you know, to do your, some of your heavy lifting, you're able to sustain a higher population utilizing those things. And at some point in time there, there's a shift, a pivotal shift, and this is the agricultural revolution, moving from being mobile hunter-gatherers, going around trying to find and scrounge things that you can eat. Remember here, we aren't scrounging for for the strawberry that you pick in your veggie patch because they aren't domesticated, it's hard to find this stuff. Like these guys, these you know hunter gatherers spend most of their time looking for food, yeah, and and surviving. So there's not much else, other you know time for anything else, which is why the shift is such a takes a long time and all the right things to align. So with with the right circumstances, then a shift towards uh, a more sedentary lifestyle off the back of agricultural, um, you know, agricultural practices can happen. So you start tending to fields and things. What this also means is that you aren't moving, you aren't nomadic anymore. You aren't moving from place to place to look for the next berry or the next little little bit of game animal that you can find or a bird or something because you've, you've eaten them all in one area, so you need to move on to the next. And with the sedentary lifestyle, it doesn't just mean that you can make you know, big farms and things, but it also means that you can start to, uh, you can start to have and own more of this cargo that you, you spoke about earlier, Lockie. So, and you can start to have cargo that you don't need to carry around with you mm. in, in two weeks' time. Uh, it's cargo like heavy pots. It's, it's cargo like a wheel or, or, you know, many, many different things uh, that are just too heavy to be supported by a nomadic lifestyle or too bulky to be supported by a nomadic lifestyle. And this is where you start to see people collecting, starting to collect that cargo um so that's it's kind of a yeah it's a brief go through the 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 plants and animals yeah that's awesome so it's just there's a lot of other things as well like there's cultural factors that develop but those relatively you know from jared's perspective and over such a long period of time, they effectively are kind of random events, you know. Um, it's not because of any sort of superiority that someone invents capitalism or communism or whatever, right? Um, but what the diffusion of the populations and having like strong clusters that are decentralised, like what happened in Europe seems to be a strong uh, causal factor um, in some way to creating new stuff. Uh, whereas, say, in China, they had the Chinese invented a significant amount of, in, had a significant amount of innovation, um, but it kind of stopped at a certain point because they had a really centralised government and 
at, at certain times decisions were made to kind of quash innovative things from happening, um, which set, which set uh, I suppose, their cause back and allowed Europeans to kind of move across the globe a bit quicker. Um, now that is a super. Well, it was, it was that, quite li- that's super rough. I'm just going to put that out. There. That is, that's you need to read the book, but that's a very very high level summary of that. But th- you get the idea, well, right? The, so. it, it, it's it's something that we see today. Like is he he actually talks about yeah that specifically, and he says that you know it's like why didn't China being as advanced as it was because. China made so many of these advancements um, across time, uh, you know, in terms of technology, in terms of, you know, developing their own, maybe argue, arguably developing their own independent writing system. That's still in contention, but um, which is super rare. There's only two, maybe three, which is the third being Chinese across the entire globe uh, as developed independently. So, um it, all it was was a political dispute. So it was one party was in power and um, they were for explorative behaviour. So the question that Diamond poses is why was it that China didn't, didn't go to the Americas and, um, you know, take over uh, as the Spanish and the Europeans did? And... Um, he argues that it's it was because of that unification and they had a political uh, party in power who was for the exploration for for these treasure boats that they had which were already going out and finding new parts of the world and the the opposing party got into power and they decided that they were completely against uh, the the current policy so they wanted to dismantle it you know in in true political fashion and so you know completely undo everything so they got rid of all the ships and they dismantled all the boat building yards and so the chinese didn't continue to go uh exploring well that's what he lays out in the book wow which is incredible yeah it is um and because they were they had early advantages in domesticatable plants and animals um, throughout that region, uh, much like Europe and the Middle East. So it is just a, it, it is just such an interesting idea, and I think that there's so much to take from it that we could, let, let's start diving into. And it made me think a lot about kind of strategy in a business. To be honest, um, was part of it. Um, but also around the idea of long-term influences of the nuances that you discussed, as well as um, what can happen in a complex random environment. Yeah, and I think one thing that we need to make really clear is the agriculturals, and we've skimmed so much of the book, we've left so much out because there's so much in it, but the agricultural societies were basically able to move to a denser population. Yes, and the denser, higher populations are able effectively to create more innovation is, is, is the short of it. Yeah. So there's more, there's more opportunity for tinkering and playing and, and people doing their, their different things. Yeah. It's, it's unless a, you have a political party that dismantles the entire thing. The, yeah. There's a few different um, factors here. The first thing is that if you've got more people, more densely populated, the amount of interactions between people increases exponentially. Um, the second thing is the more food that you've got, the more you're hanging around, the more free time you have to devote to other things. So those two things kind of compound on each other. And the third that you said is that people are also um, able to uh, keep a bunch of stuff to tinker with too. And so there's kind of the next thing. And all these things kind of, um, and let's say, let's say you're all together, you're tinkering, this sort of thing happens, and you, Ryan, invent writing, and you know this is an amazing thing you've invented writing, awesome. If you're in a well population of hunter gatherers with three hundred people, it's not super clear that it's that 
as useful as it is and you can't diffuse it across as many people. So the gain from actually inventing that and spreading it is is somewhat limited. Whereas if you can start to spread that across quite a large number of people, it then enables, it kind of compounds because something like writing is a good example I picked, then enables greater communication, which again increases the amount of innovation that can happen and it's this snowball effect. Um, if, you, if you're living, like if you're living in a hunter-gatherer tribe, you don't need writing. You can just go talk to someone. You can go, you know, you don't need to track things with things because you use your memory, you use your stories. And that's the, that's the point there. And in certain environments, it's, it's just not obvious that farming's a good idea. Like it seems that no, was something else. There was else. Many, many cases where they started and went back to yeah. hunter-gathering because they couldn't support themselves. Yeah, you just end up, there's a lot of starvation if you get, if you get um, farming wrong, a lot of people starve to death. Um, <laughs> so it's kind of quite a specific thing, which the, I didn't know or even think about that before reading this book. Yeah, well, there's so many, so again, so many factors like geography plays a huge part some geographies just cannot support that farming to continue on because it needs to not just continue on once, you know, for one year. It needs to continue on for years and years and years and years and years and, years and be able to be sustained in that geography. So let's let's take away the specifics of talking around the book in terms of the fact that we're talking about humans and the way we move around and stuff and to treat it a bit more as a system we'll still come back using those examples but what are some of the key things that you took from this that are relevant across different systems hmm. that's a good question mate um to to be honest it actually resonates with a lot of things that we actually often talk about. Um, so I want to bring in chance or luck and I want to bring in uh, this idea of iteration and um, almost exposure to events. So it's it's pretty clear that, that luck plays a significant role. Um, but then you also see situations where you can go, you can be, you can kind of um, uh, jeopardize your situation. So in the case of the political political opposition that China had in its unified state, that caused a lot of problems uh, or arguably a lot of problems in terms of, you know, it's probably, it's it being the one to discover or, you know, take over the, the, the Americas there. Um, again, very broad strokes here. Yeah. So the, for me, I think trying to bring it into like a context of today is how do you, how do you seek to increase your luck? How do you seek to increase those iterations? How do you seek to increase the, the, the instances mm -hmm. of all those things happening, uh, particularly from a, an innovation sense, I think. Yeah. Um, because that's how innovations happened. And innovation, he makes a really strong point in the book about innovation. Um, it, it, isn't, it doesn't just come from geniuses. Like it, we don't just have, you know, Einstein who comes up with everything to do with quantum mechanics and general relativity just like that it's always iteration yeah they're always building on the systems that have been put in place prior to them yeah and so those enabling those systems to be the shoulders in which you stand you know even even across across you know time scales that we deal in today you know for for, for our lives establishing those those systems or establishing lots of iterations or possibilities of those systems where they're exposed to the elements. Yeah. Am I talking too abstract here? Does that make sense? No, I, I, I do understand. You know, it's, yeah. it's, it's a great point and I think that the idea of, I suppose, 
setting up something to increase your luck is kind of what you're getting at, I think. Mm. Okay. And exposure to to experimenting. Yeah. So it's that tinkering, isn't it? It's it's that, you know, build upon those that have come before you, but keep tinkering, keep putting new things together and those sort of things. Um, I would take it even higher, like, and back a step further in it. It, something it made me realise is that I'm not actually as good at my job for running a business as I think I am. I'm just in a, I'm in a particularly good environment. Mm. So, and actually choosing the type of environment that you're going to put yourself in so that it's got good natural resources, the weather's good in this case in the book, but in, in your, if you're starting a company or a career or something, pick a rising tide, you know, um, as best you can. Um, I would argue pick something very old if you can because it's, it's durable. It's unlikely to be replaced, but pick something that's growing in the same way. Um, so, I suppose there are a lot of examples of that. Like, if you want to pick some, if, you know, when I went to Europe and saw a Roman bridge, and I'm a civil engineer, that's a good sign to me that a civil engineering is still going to be a wanted job two thousand years from now. If it was two thousand years ago, um, maybe the same. If that's you- assuming we're not all uploaded into the matrix, Lockie. That's true. But, but you might be you able know, to build some virtual bridges by then. Still software engineering, so we'll <laughs> jump into that. Um, slight tangent, but the point holds. Pick something that you think is going to grow and, and be in an area where you can interact with a lot of different things and get exposure to a lot of stuff. So generally, you probably want to be in a city. Um if you, mm. if you can, uh, or somewhere that you're going to be seeing a lot of people moving around, doing a lot of things, a lot of opportunities in, in, in cities. So that, that environmental selection often has a much bigger impact on your success than some, in many ways, your skill level. <laughs> so that was one of the early things I took from it. And then I kind That's of That's really powerful, mate. Thought, yeah. Yeah, thanks. And then I also thought around technological advantages for societies. I often kind of wondered why America put so much money into military spending and part of it that it's got some kind of there's like a self-fulfilling prophecy to the spending and the lobbying and all that stuff, so no doubt. But technological advantage is power in between nations. So it kind of helped me understand foreign policy a bit better because... You know, seeing what the Mongols did with just having a horse is, and remember, we start that all people have the same starting point and then this group had a horse and dominated half the world. You know, that's interesting and, and that happens again and again and again. And they had horses and they also had bows and arrows. Mm. There's been There's been many instances of societies not adopting bows and arrows because they were too impractical compared to what they had which is just unbelievable. Mm. And the same goes for every single technological advancement across across time. It kind of raises the question. It's like, well, how do you know? You know, how do you know which is the the fork to follow? You know, have you did you did you think about that at all, Lockie? So, Can you you know, for example, the big the big political fight I'll bring up again in in China, but between the the those that wanted the the ships and the exploration to happen versus those that didn't want the ships and the exploration to happen. Um, so you're, how do you know what, what the right decision is in the fork in the road? Are you talking about if I'm the leader of China or if just as a general person? I'm talking about you as the leader of the business here, Lockie. Ah. And you've got, a, you've got a similar fork in the road to, to approach do we go with this technology or this technology? Do we keep with what we've got now or risk run the risk on this this space here? I think that you... Is there anything glean for you? Yeah. yeah. I, okay, I'll try and answer this question. I think that it's got to do with you don't want to try and control things too hard from the top down. 
you want to try and follow the wind a little bit. So if you can get your business big enough but not too big so it's ruled by bureaucracy and you're constantly taking bets on things and, and kind of trying stuff from the bottom up, you can kind of guide it as to what works and and you know the best the most enduring systems are the ones that are, are bottom up you know and, the, and so to me that would be the the ultimate answer <laughs> excuse me that would be my preference but a business isn't evolution so you can't or you can't do that you need to make decisions it's like so but i i would i would err on the side of trying a lot of things trying 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 and copying other people is pretty good start (laughs) you let things become diffused to you Um, pick pick something that's going to be go up and have you know you have some sort of defensive barrier get lots of produce lots of food i.e have good margins get good amount of business in the door make sure your population density is up and people are connecting to one another within your four walls and then don't go too lean on just making money all the time and always being operational you need to be yeah operational efficiencies yeah Yeah. have the doers and the thinkers have the scholars have the that's how you really build a resilient resilient business that lean towards decentralization i think which is the opposite of most yeah what what companies do once they get big i think yeah which happens for a number of reasons because we start to reach limits of effective management of people and um there's compliance things that happen and um but i think i think with the advent of technology, the the ability to keep things as flat as possible is is increasing. And I tend to agree with your point there that once things get to a certain size, it's no longer possible to do what I just said. So it's probably better to just silo things out completely at a certain point. If your if your goal is yeah. like so, let's take China as like one of the oldest countries in the world. And they've been highly centralized. So it depends kind of what your goals are. Like that's a very successful enterprise, China, right? It's still around. Um, they may not have conquered the world, but who says that's a good thing anyway? Yeah, well, I think... I think um To, to some degree, it's inherently human, mate, and I suspect it's 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 within our hardwiring to to as the need to do that because it it stems from the place of again going back to the the hunter gatherer tribes is uh, actually it's probably it's probably post them, but the bigger the society was, the bigger the tribe was, the more ability that they had to take over others and if they didn't do the taking over they would be taken over it seemed to be a trend throughout the book i suspect there's a hard wiring yeah it seemed to be a trend throughout the book that the different uh tribes all over the world regardless of continent the bigger the tribe the more aggressive it seemed to get (laughs) i wonder if that's sort of a, a function of groups too yeah it's almost like there's a perpetual you know, spread the ideology. We have the right ideology. We've got this sorted out. Now we need to bring everyone else on board. And this is where you see the great empires of, you know, of all time and and religions and et cetera, you know, doing, doing that. Mm. Get in, get in, you know, get in tow with the, the, our ideology because if, if, if our ideology is wrong, Everything we know is wrong <laughs> yeah, and that's not going to happen. Hmm. So I think the whole story is kind of about innovation in, in some form or another. 
I feel. Yeah, well, it, it really is because it's it's not just looking about how we can create the innovation, but it's about how we can actually adopt it too. How do we, because again, there's been so many times of, of societies backpedaling, you know, because something wasn't effective or uh, a common thing you see these days is huge investments into a way of doing something or a technology. And then that technology is outdated uh, a few years later. I think uh, an example is uh, the, the oil lanterns in London. There was a huge investment outlaid into investing into oil lanterns. And um, so London resisted or maybe England resisted uh, utilising electri- electrical much more effective, much cheaper uh, lanterns to light the streets uh, for many, many years after after the technology was available and commercially available. Mm. I think you'd you'd go from like America to England, just be gobsmacked with with what was what was going on. <laughs> yeah, it's that's, like this entrenchment. That's, that's... There's an entrenchment, inherent entrenchment. Yeah, I, I think it's like that chiefs priests and thieves thing right it's like that's the three types of people that slow innovation down and, and slowing innovation can be a good thing <laughs> if it's kind of like uh going to be excessively you know cause bad outcomes for a population uh, not all innovation towards that naturally is perpetually going is is kind of a good thing right uh, yeah but and the the challenge the challenge we've got today, mate, is the how embedded or entrenched the idea of innovation is, or the need for innovation within the system is. As in, we the the flow of money within institutions today is bet on the idea of innovation. It's bet on the idea of growth, and. You, so you can't just turn the tap off of innovation now because if you turn the tap off of innovation, the entire system falls down. Mm. Yeah, that seems to be to be what to be true. Um, something else about innovation I found super interesting from this book was that really good ideas are very very hard to find, and secondly, when you do find them, it's not that clear they're great ideas. And some of that kind of goes to your point around the regression from, say, taking out bow and arrows to kind of forgetting or putting them back down because maybe that technology is not helpful in this certain environment. But if I change my environment slightly, it, it does become very important or it's not useful at this size. So that might be irrelevant for if you're building a team or a business certain things start to make a lot more sense after a critical mass. Um, yeah, if, if, if we've kind of hit on, th- this reminds me so much of, of Peter Thiel's seven questions, mm. you know, and there's so much crossover between those questions and, um, you know, for running a or building a successful business. Because you look at you look at the I think it's like question number one. It's like create technology that's not you know one point five or two times better. Create technology that's ten times better. Hmm. If you're in the space of creating technology that's ten times better, how do you know that that you've gone down the right path? Yeah, is the is that is that question? And then the second piece of that is. Because we've gone down, you know, we've taken a leap down that that fork in the road. How do we know this is the right time to be jumping into that fork in the road? You know, yeah. Are we are we are we playing with are we playing with uh, big heavy pots and pans when we need to be mobile every single day? Yeah, it doesn't quite it doesn't quite click into place until you've got a couple of other things that then turn that thing into making sense. Hmm. Have you got any other any other uh, big takeaways from, from the book, Lockie? I think just like the power of 
compounding advantages over time is incredible. And, and But then it's also sort of the factor that if you do the right kind of behaviours long enough, it'll probably lead you to grow um, as long as you are starting in an environment that allows that. If you don't have that, you've got nothing. Your environment yeah. is so, so important. That is my biggest takeaway from this book. It doesn't matter if you're the smartest person on earth. If, if you're not in the right environment, you're going to find it really hard to um, to succeed at, or you're going to find it harder than someone who is. Do you think the um? Do you think Naval Ravikant's you know his four types of luck hold up here? So type one's blind luck. Yeah, sheer dumb luck. Yeah. Love that saying. So yes, so that that's part one. So that can happen, but time generally nulls that out. And so the interesting thing about this book is that the four types of luck, you can start to think about those across time and across many iterations. So everyone will get equally lucky over a long enough period of time, right, theoretically. So that cancels itself out, I think. Um, The best way to take advantage of that is to quickly diffuse that across a huge population. (laughs) So if you're in a big group, that first type of luck's probably better, so maybe it doesn't, it does leverage over time that way. you might have to prompt me with some of the other types, but type two luck was like, yeah. Uh, sorry. Yeah, it's like kick up, kick up as much dust as possible is like luck type two. So you know, the more the more different things that you do, the more things that you get exposed to, uh, the more possibility you have of encountering luck. The third type of luck is you are an expert in something, or you. And therefore, things are more easily observable. So you can spot luck. You can start to see luck and and see where there's better opportunities than others. And then there's the fourth type of luck, which you don't even need to go out and seek those opportunities for luck because luck happens upon you because of other people or because of other, other people bringing you situations because you're renowned for that expertise in, in luck. So I think there's a complex answer to these that could be quite long. Uh, I think probably the best way to summarise is that all those types of luck are going to be much more powerful and have much longer lasting effects and more able to happen in a society that isn't just providing sustenance, one that is highly connected and one that is in a large group. Um, So that's probably my answer to the question. And, you know, for example, if luck type four, if you're such an expert that you're the only one that gets sought out, well, you're only going to become that expert if you've got time to, to do it and someone else is putting food on the table, right? And then you need to be known for that. So you need some form of communication. The better type of communication, the more likely you are to be found and sought out. And then if you have a big group with um, some good rules in the society, you can be kind of, uh, you know, track the incentives and and make it so you don't fight each other as well. So I think all those things, among other things, would, would kind of make that type of luck more prevalent in a in a sustained in a more densely populated um, affluent society that doesn't have to worry about yeah. living hand to mouth. And I think what's I think what's really clear is we simply cannot predict the future. And so the you know the more that we can tend towards those higher end levels of luck um within the right environments, et cetera, et cetera, the better off that we will be. The, because um, the reality is we can't see what things may evolve into themselves. 
what certain technologies may evolve into themselves. That's a uh, very and how good they point. change across time. That's a very very good point. And I think we're going to see that. You know, here's a prediction. After I just finished saying we shouldn't shouldn't make predictions, but I think uh, we're starting to see that unfold with social media, for example. And we're only start, you know, we're only really picking up on the repercussions of social media, and social media is is likely um, to go <laughs> towards being more of a like commodity, or you know, like 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 a utility. Uh, I think is someone someone has described it uh, as, and that makes a lot of sense. Um, but let's see what happens. Hmm. Yeah, I think um, I think it's a great book. I think everyone should, if not read the book, find a really good summary of it and understand this because it's fundamental to the way the world has become the way it is. And it's also, I guess, wonderful to understand the differences in the way everything turned out and why. And it's got so many parallels to all the systems that we see around us in the world and the way that things play out on the large scale and the very small scale and how you can best influence that um, to kind of live the life you want. Well, I think that's a nice little place to wrap up, Lockie, and I might just leave us with a uh, a quote that, that harps on the last, the last point we made there um, related to, to technology. And it comes from the anthropologist Claude Levi Strauss. He says that ancient writing's main function was to facilitate the enslavement of other human beings. Personal uses of non professionals came much later as writing systems grew simpler and more expressive. Thanks very much. We'll leave it there. <laughs>